Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We honor you today. Lord, I just say it's been good to be in your presence. Lord, thank you for a time of refreshing, Lord. Thank you for a a season, a, a place, a spot in our life, Lord, where we can break away from this present world and enter into a different dimension, Father, with you, Lord, and get life and get grace and get mercy. And so, Father, I thank you. Lord, I just ask, Lord, as we move into the preaching or the teaching of your word, Lord, I, I, I can't do anything without you. So, Lord, I ask, I acknowledge you. You're the teacher, Lord. This is your word. I don't own anything of it, Lord, but you put it and you deposit it in earthen vessels of which I desire this morning, Lord, to pour out this afternoon to pour out. So, Lord, we ask for your blessings in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So just one thing, I want to honor my son. Son, will you stand up? For you, for, you, for you that don't know, this is my oldest son. His name is John Paul Campbell. He is uh, 20 years old. He's currently serving in the Marine Corps. He's in Japan. And his beautiful young lady sitting beside him is also a Marine. And she's also over there. They're both serving together. So if you get an opportunity, say hi to them. But son, I honor you. I respect you. Amen. I love you. Amen. Thank you. So we're going to move into... The coming of the Lord. Pre, post, mid, tribulation. Amen. I thought that might be some of you guys enjoy. So this is going to be the verse that we're going to kind of just take off from. And um, not just in light of what Pastor Scott shared last week when he done an awesome job. I just, this is something that's been on my heart for a while. And even last week at the prison, this is kind of the thought that God had given me. And it's just been on my heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. And this, that little part is going to be key throughout this whole time we have this afternoon. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So what I want to look at this morning is we're speaking about the coming of the Lord. We're going to look at two things, basically. Briefly, the last trump, but more importantly, we're going to look at the mystery. So if I, I want to give you 60 seconds. What surrounds, what is commonly thought of that accompanies the coming of the Lord? Where is it? If somebody says the Lord's coming or you hear about the coming of the Lord, what is the first things that begin to come to our heart and our mind? You have an opportunity. I'll give you some time that you can speak out loud. What's that? Tribulation. A rapture. What about War. We think about the coming of the Lord. We think about wars and rumors of wars. We think about earthquakes. We think about, you know, famine and, and, and just hunger and food shortages. We think about a pestilence that sweeps the land. We, you know, we think about tsunamis and the waves raging and warring. That's the things that we commonly always look to. But I believe there's something else that God wants to speak to us. Let's look. Matthew 24 says, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name saying, I am Christ, I am Messiah, I am anointed. All those words fit. And will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah or there, don't believe it. For false Christ and false the prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. 
See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner chamber or the inner room, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. It's amazing that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, would put that last block in there. And the word carcass means exactly a carcass, a dead body. But eagles is not a very fitting place. It's actually vultures or buzzards. So he likens his coming to a dead carcass and vultures circling this guy. How many of you have ever been driving down the road and you didn't see a dead body, but you did see in the heavens that they were bu- buzzards or vultures that were circling? And in your mind, you said something must be dead over there, right? That's the logic that he's talking about. So when you see all these things, our focus should not be on the earth. Our focus should be turning towards the heavens, right? Because as the coming of the Son of Man it'll be, it'll be the same way as as where the carcass is, there will the vultures be gathered together. Luke 21 says, And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. And when you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads your redemption draws near or nigh. Revelation chapter 1, listen to this. Behold, John the Revelator, the one that got this from Yeshua through an angel, says he comes with clouds. Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Acts chapter 1 says this. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, which said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. How did he leave? A cloud came down. He stepped on the cloud. The cloud took him out of their sight. While they're watching this cloud carry him away, the angels that stood beside him said, why do you stand here gazing? And the way that he came is the way that he's going back. Amen? So that's going to be key as we move through the rest of this. So we're going to begin to look at some scriptures of concerning the coming of the Son of Man. How can you, in this generation, in this time, discern when the Son of Man is coming? When we have a pre-trib, we have a post-trib, we have mid-trib, we have no-trib. we got all this stuff, right? Everybody's telling us when He's coming, but what does the Bible and the Scripture tell us? How can we clearly ascertain this is the day and the time when the Lord is going to come because the Scriptures say so? And there's several things that must be accompanying His return. Matthew 24 again. Then He appeared the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 26 says, Jesus said to them, You have said, Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Mark 13 says this, and when they say, and then you shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now these are common scriptures that we most of us know. But is this just a New Testament teaching? Is this just something that the Apostle Paul or maybe John the Revelator or maybe Mark got a glimpse of? 
Zephaniah said, The day of the Lord's wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of waste and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a cloud, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Nahum says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. And Joel says, A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds in a thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. In the last verse before we get into where I want to get to, Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. The reason why I try to labor that is because of being able to scripturally put our finger on the place where the Son of Man comes and the body of Christ is taken out of this place is crucial. Because as Brother Matthew said, there is darkness on the land presently, but there's a thick darkness that is coming. A darkness that even can be felt. A darkness that comes in and waves in, and, and men and women, the Bible declares over and over again, that this kingdom, that men and women even like gnash or chew on their tongue because it'll be so dark. So it's very crucial that you and I understand the Scriptures. <clears throat> Paul was speaking of, and he has a certain knowledge. There's not a whole lot of Scripture if you go digging about the trumpets and the last one and the first one and how many they are. And it's very limited. You can get to studying and look at some of the, uh, <clears throat> some of the church fathers, what they believed, and some of the rabbis. And there's a lot of conjecture and a lot of thought. But scripturally speaking, it's not, there's not a ton of stuff there. So it's interesting that Paul really had a revelation that he was sharing to the body. But the word at, I want to get this before we go. When we look at the word at, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. The word at does not mean at the commencement. It means throughout or under or in or during the time of the seventh trumpet. <clears throat> this is the verse. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, this is Paul speaking, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And he goes on in 5, nine, saying, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but obtained salvation through our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. So there's several things that Paul pointed out. One, the Lord himself descends. Two, there's a shout. There's the voice of an archangel. The trumpet of God is blown. The dead in Christ or the saints of God are seen. And those who are alive and remaining are called up to meet the Lord in the clouds. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, how shall we prepare for the battle? Now this is interesting that Paul would put this in 1 Corinthians 14, which is right before 15, where he begins to show us a mystery. And one of the things I think is absolutely crucial, brothers and sisters, and we know this as we're walking through, when you and I begin to walk through the feast and we just walk through the day of trumpets, we're getting understanding of what the sound of the trumpet really is to do, right? If the trumpet is unknown, is that reveille or is that a call to arms? Is it time to eat or are they playing taps? I don't understand and I don't recognize the sound of the shofar or the trumpet. So if it makes an undistinct sound, how how shall men, how shall the world prepare themselves for the battle? Not a battle, it's the battle. So Paul knew that, and he was writing to the church of Corinth, if the trumpet sounds and nobody understands it, nobody's going to prepare for what's getting ready to happen. 
You should be thankful, brothers and sisters, that God has got us in a place where we're beginning to understand. Will it be like the way we blow it? Probably not. But we're trying to get used to the sounding of the shofar. And one day that one will sound, whether it's the first or the last, and we'll hear it. And something will transpire in us that something happens and we leave this earth, right? Because we're being tuned and trained to its voice. Now listen, this is where we're getting to. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be complete, as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Now this is where I'm trying to get to. When the seventh angel sounds, something is finished. And it's interesting that it's the last trumpet that brings in the seventh, this completion, that there's a mystery that has now been completed. And that's what we're going to look at for the remainder of the time we have this afternoon. What is the mystery? This is crucial. Corinthians again, behold, I show you a mystery. This is Paul. We shall not all sleep. But we all shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Mark says, Yeshua speaking says, it's given to you to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to them that are without, all these things are done in parables. So if you're a believer... It's given to you to know what this mystery is. However, we speak among them, those that are mature, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world to our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So God is saying right here that there was, a, in God's wisdom, there was a mystery that's been hidden and it's been ordained since the beginning. It's interesting as we begin to go through this, that when God looked at a man called Abram, he called him a father of many nations, a father of many dialects, a father of many colors, a father of many ethnicities. He, he called him a father of nations when he called him. So this knowledge and wisdom and mystery that Paul got was something that God knew in the beginning because the Bible declares, he declares the end from the beginning. So God's plan, which has always been, it's always been there, but men and women have not always understood the plan of God. Why? It's a mystery. Look in Romans. Now to him that has the power to establish you according to my gospel, Paul speaking, and the preaching of Yeshua the Messiah according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So Paul said, and he agreed with uh, Revelation ten seven that this secret has been kept since the world began. And it was only revealed to prophets and to saints. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I briefly written to you, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow inheritors of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So the mystery is you. You sitting here right now are the mystery. 
It was revealed to prophets. It was revealed to saints. It was revealed to men and women of God. But as the majority, they did not see it, nor did they believe it. When God gave it to a Jewish nation, they took it to themselves, and they looked at the Goyim and said, it's not for you. Matter of fact, when Yeshua said, listen, where I go, you cannot come. They said what? Will he go to the Goyim and teach them? Will he kill himself? What is this that he says, where I go, you cannot come? What is this that he means? So it's interesting that the mystery that is completed is the mystery of the, of the, of the Gentiles, of the Goyim, of the nations being brought in and grafted into the one tree, being partaker of the one root, being partaker of the root and the fatness of this one thing, because there's one faith, there's one Lord, there's one baptism, amen. Do you know that? How many of you know that Jesus Christ never baptized anybody? His disciples water baptized. Do you know why? He said, I have a baptism, and he does baptize, but he baptizes in the Holy Spirit. That's the baptism that he's looking for, amen? You and I take people to the water, and we baptize them unto repentance. We lead them into repentance. But there is coming one who, who's, the Bible, as John said it, whose shoes were, not unwor were unworthy to loosen, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, right? There's one faith, one Lord, and one baptism. Those that are baptized and believe, they are the ones that are saved. That's the truth. So the mystery that actually comes to a completion when the seventh angel sounds is the mystery of all the nations being allowed to come in and be a partaker of of the root and the fatness. The, the natural olive branches have been snapped off. God in His grace has taken wild olive branches and grafted them into this one tree. It's one old story. It was in the beginning. It'll be in the end. It's the same story. Amen. But in the process of time, there was a few branches broken off to make room for a couple more branches that He wanted to put in. Right? And that's you. To me, Paul says, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of the Messiah. And now listen, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the age of the world has been hidden in God who created all things through Yeshua the Messiah. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord. To make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of this world was hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent. Now listen, now that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church, what is the church supposed to do? The church is supposed to proclaim this to the powers and the principalities and the things in the heaven. What? The angels desire to look into what, this, what was going on. Do you know that? The angels desire to look into salvation. The angels desire to look into redemption. The angels desire to look into man being redeemed from a curse and brought into a living union with the God of heaven. The angels are curious about that very work. Do you know that? It's been hidden for ages until about 2,000 years ago when the Son of God died on a bloody cross outside of the city, amen, and He gave up His life 
The apostles were charged with a great power and they begin to go out through all of the world proclaiming that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, was the Messiah of God and that the, 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 the promise of the new covenant is that God would give them His Holy Spirit and they would be born of His they would be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, but they would also be spirit of his spirit. Look in Galatians. Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He did not say to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, who is the Messiah? And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. As an uncircumcised man, God promised Abram. Do you know that? Do you know that it's commonly believed that Abram's father was a idol, not only an idol worshiper, but an idol maker? So Abraham is a great picture of who we are, right? We believe that. He was first called a Hebrew. Whenever he was called out of his world, he heard the voice of his God. It spoke to him. And we know from, from teachings that most people believe that he was not the first man to hear the voice of God. He was the first man to hear and obey. He was the first man that heard his voice and said, oh, I believe you, God, I'll do what you said to me to do. And God said, for doing that, Abraham, you are a righteous man, and I will make a covenant with you. And we are here. For you are all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Right, John? For as many as you as were baptized in the Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all in one Christ Jesus. And if you are in the Messiah, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What is the promise? What is the promise? We sung that song, Great is Your Faithfulness to Me. You know, one of the things I thought as I just sat there, as I just, I just wept before the Lord because He's gave me, listen, that Bible that you carry around, hopefully you carry a Bible around and you actually read it, is full of promises, right? But they're not all for you. You can say what you want to. They're all there. But there's a few that God gives you specifically. And all of a sudden, that word that's been there for ages now has life and it is personal to you. And that's the stone you pick up and you fight your giant with. That's the stone you fling at Goliath and watch him fall face down in front of you because it's a promise that God has given you, right? God gave Abraham a promise. Abraham, you will be a father of multitudes of nations. You will be that man. Abraham said, I don't even have any children. How can this be? Sarah laughed. Shall I, being way up in years, 90 years old, shall I know pleasure? Shall I give birth? Shall I have a child to dandle upon my knees? Shall I even experience that? Abraham said, why'd you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. He said, oh, but you did. Not because he heard him, because God said she did. Amen. So I want to ask you a question. I was going to do this early. Do you have a promise from God this, this afternoon? I got a promise. I got many promises that God has promised me. And every now and then I hold it back in front of him and say, God, you promised me. God, you promised. This is what you said to me. You promised me. And because you promised me this, I'm believing you. See, when God gives you a promise, you grab it and you hold on to it until the very end. The Bible declares that when Abraham Against hope, believed in hope that he would be the father of many nations. 
Because he didn't have a son, then he did have a son, and God said, I want you to sacrifice your son. And even in doing the sacrifice, going up the mount, he still believed in God. If he took his life, God would raise that man back up. He had faith in God. Do you have a promise from God? I have a promise. I have many promises this morning. And some of them you don't even realize until you get older. You know what I mean? I'll be honest, I have a, uh, we have a lot of children, and they're all very special to me. And I don't even like to say this, um, but there's something about a father and having a, a son at his right hand that's special. As I get older, I think, how much, God, I want to be like that. Because you said, you looked at Yeshua one day, said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then he highly exalted him. And now he's called the son of my right hand. He's on my right. He's right here. And how valuable those promises are. Amen. I have a promise. Revelation 11. Then the angel sounded, the seventh angel that is, and there was a loud voice in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces, and they worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and that those who fear your name, small and great, and you should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened, Opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple, and there was lightnings and noises and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So in process of reading the book of Revelation, we get to chapter number 11, and this is, well, let's back up. Chapter 10 says, when the seven trumpet sounds, the mystery of God is completed. If you go one more chapter in the Revelation, chapter 11, verse 15, the trumpet sounds and there's, there's a loud cry from an angel who said, Now has come salvation. Now has come the time to judge. Now has come the time to reward the children, the servants of God. And listen, now has come the time that you should destroy them that destroy the earth. Whenever that sunk into my heart one day, that changed my view on what we call Armageddon and the last days and the coming of the Lord. Do you believe the Scriptures? Yeshua just said He's coming back to destroy something that's trying to destroy His earth. We always look at the coming of the day of the Lord as if God is absolutely wiping off the face of the earth. And there's a truth there. But what He is doing, He is removing from the earth things that are trying to destroy the earth. Do you understand that? Do you know there's a plot as we stand right now? There is a plot to get the population from 8 billion to 500 million within a few years. There's where we're at. It's an absolute plan of the enemy, satanic in its root, to take the world's population down to 500. There's stones in Georgia that say this. Their goal is to get... The population down. That's where they're going. That's where they want to go. And so when sometimes when you and I speak about the coming of the Lord, it can be a fearful thing. If you're in sin, if you're outside of the covenant of grace, if you're walking far off from God, if you're dabbling in the world, that should strike a holy fear in your heart. I pray to God that it would do that. Because that day is a great, but it is a terrible day. It's a great day for the children of God. It's a terrible day for those that are outside of Christ. And for the wicked ones, it is a great and a terrible day. But the good news for you and I, if we're watching and we're being, being able to discern where God is coming, we're in a process of preparing ourselves to meet the bridegroom. Amen? Ain't that the season that we're walking through right now? 
What is the Feast of Tabernacles also called? The ingathering. A feast of harvesting. Now this is my understanding, okay? Bear with me. If you remember the mystery of God would be complete, as in says Romans 10 or Revelation 10, 7. In Revelation 11, we see two witnesses that show up, which God declares in His Word must agree before any judgment could be rendered. Revelation eleven fifteen, the seven, the seven trumpets sounds, and in 12 and 13, John sees a few visions. He sees, he sees a woman clothed with sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars upon her head. There's a great dragon that appears in front of this woman who has seven heads and ten horns. She's pregnant. It wants to devour the child. She gives birth to the child. The child is called back up into heaven, and this dragon persecutes the seed. We learn the seed. The seed of this woman, right? She flees off into the wilderness. But John also sees a beast that rises up out of the sea and a beast that rises up out of the earth. And most commentators believe the one that rises out of the earth is the Antichrist himself. And then we move into Revelation 14 and we see the coming of the Son of Man. So this is what I believe God had showed me years and years ago. Is the, my understanding. The reason why there seems to be, to me, this odd place in the book of Revelation, Revelation, even like Pastor Scott was speaking chiastically, you know, if you look at 11, 12, that's the real core of the whole book because you see the picture. So it's interesting that as soon as the trumpet, the last trumpet sounds, all of a sudden there seems to be a break between the sounding of the trumpet and the actual coming of the Son of Man. And there's all these pictures or, or, or visions or uh, things that are seen or projected into the book of Revelation. You, to me, the, the woman is the gospel. You see the very thought, the very plan of God from the very beginning to the end. There's a woman. She has 12 stars. She's pregnant. She gives birth to one that's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Whenever the child comes up, this dragon seeks to devour it. Remember when Herod wanted to kill all the children because there was a prophecy? Who is this one born king of the Jews? And so Herod sends out word that all the children from two and under should die. And there was a great massive slaughtering of the children. And then in Roman or in Revelation going on, you see this great beast system that rises up out of the sea, which most believe is like a just a multitude of nations or peoples. And then this weird looking creature comes up out of the earth and he's diverse, he's different, he's fierce looking. And then it goes back to when, and we're going to read it in just a second, when the, the effect of the seventh trumpet actually happens. Look right here. Oh, let me get this, yeah. Revelation 14, 1 says this. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him was 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harps playing with their harps, and I sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000. Now look, who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones that were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones that follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no deceit. For they are without fault before the throne of God. This is the verse that sealed that there is no pre-tribulation rapture for me. If these are the first fruits redeemed off the earth, how can Revelation 4 be the rapture of the church if these are the first fruits? Ain't that what the Bible says? These are they that were redeemed from the earth, being first fruits of unto God. And it's after the seventh trumpet has sounded. 
So if there is a pre-tribulation rapture and we escape, how is it possible that these are first fruits if John somehow represents the calling of the church out of the world? Matter of fact, if you look at Scripture, the church is always represented as a woman and not as a man. And there's a lot of things that accompany the coming of the Son of Man that are not found in Revelation 4. For John says, I heard a voice like a trumpet that said, come up here and I'm going to show you things that must shortly or speedily come to pass. And he gets the whole revelation of the day of the Lord, the unveiling of the day of the Lord. But in Revelation 14, 14 says this, Then I looked and behold, a white cloud And on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle, for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he he that sat upon the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him with a sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and the earth was gathered, the vine of the earth was gathered, and they threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God, and the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress to the horse's bridle for 1,600 furlongs. First Thessalonians says that we are to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Yeshua, who has delivered us from the wrath to come. And he goes on to say, For God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation, and that by our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. So my understanding is, if I was to place us anywhere along the track, and there would be more than just an eight, a, a young teenager back in the 1800s having a dream, if I wanted to be biblical and I wanted to be scripturally correct, there's a lot of things that have to be taken place for me to put my finger on it says it looks like it's going to be around this season. But you and I look, we see the seven trumpet, we see it sounding, we see a cloud coming down, we see one like the Son of Man, we see a gathering or a harvest of raking up the children and another, at the same time there's another harvest where some are gathered and they're thrown into the wrath of Almighty God. But yet you and I escape the wrath of God, but Paul says we through much tribulation do enter in into the kingdom. Romans 11 For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. What's the mystery? That's the mystery. And so all of Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the giftings and the callings of God are without repentance. For as you in times past did not believe God, yet now have obtained mercy through their the Israelites, the Jewish nation, be unbelief, even so having these also not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God has concluded them all in all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Look in Luke. Look at the last line. And Jerusalem shall be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. 
So what is the mystery that is completed when the seventh angel begins to sound his trumpet? The mystery that is completed is you and I being a partaker of the root and fatness, being brought into one person. The Bible declares that God, and through Christ, tore down the middle wall of partition, and he made one new man, right? No more male, no more female, no more bond, no more Scythian, none of this stuff. We are one new man in Christ. He tore that down. That's the mystery, brothers and sisters, that's been hidden since God started the gospel. I came here this morning about, I don't know, it was before six o'clock, and I was walking up, and I just looked up into the heavens, and all of a sudden, it was just amazing how bright and clear the sky was. And there's no way you and I can look into the heavens and see, even though God might have done this, there's an order when they stuck, Right? There's shapes. There's, there's seemingly, there's wisdom behind it. The Bible declares, and I wanted to read it this morning, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. Matter of fact, every day and every night their speech is going on, but do we have ears to hear what they're actually saying? The Bible says in Job that the morning stars, they sang together as He created all things. And when He created it, He had a plan that you and I might be in the household of God, planted in the tree. Who's He coming for? He's coming for the remnant of her seed, just like the dragon is coming for the remnant of her seed. Who are they? It's they that have the testimony of Jesus Christ, but they also keep the commandments of God. That's the apple of God's eye. It's always been, always will be. John chapter 1. What does it say? That we become the children of God not by blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. But by God, we became his children. I'm almost done. Second Thessalonians. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Pastor Scott taught on this last week or week before. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Whose coming is after the working of Satan? He's talking about the coming of the Lord. And with all, and even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they did not believe nor receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause. God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And I wrote there the lie because if you look at it in the Greek, it's an emphatic article. Do you know that that's also used one other time of Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition? That they all might be condemned who did not, be, did not believe the truth. But listen, where do they have pleasure? Their pleasure was in unrighteousness. Revelation 12, the whole story of the gospel from beginning to end. Revelation 13, the beast system and the coming lawless one and the Antichrist. And Revelation 14, the coming Messiah is after the working of Satan. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Yeshua, God will bring with him. And Enoch, and this is the last verse. Also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints. I remember, and I guess you have to forgive me, I was in a Baptist church many, many years ago. I wasn't raised Hebrew, I came in, or Messianic. I wasn't even raised in church. But God had showed me this, and um, I waited two years to preach this message in that church. Because they're pre-trib. Amen. Every, every, shab, every, or every Sunday, it's, you know, God's going to rake us out of here, and and I just struggled with that. I'm like, I just don't see that clearly in the scriptures. And one day I got, there was my lot to fall for me to preach. And this was on my heart. And I just thought, I'm just going to, I'm just going to preach it. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Amen. And um, 
the pastor of the church at the time had made a couple of statements. You remember, Brother John, John you remember uh, Pastor Kenny Whaley, Cherokee Mountain. And he had made a couple of statements. One time he was preaching, he said, you know, I don't even know when it's going to happen. I thought, praise the Lord, you know. <laughs> you don't even know. <laughs> so, and, and again, I waited. There was times I wanted to preach this, and God didn't give me liberty. But that day there was liberty in the house. And I never saw this like this. But God allowed me to share this message in the whole church with the majority of a couple. They all turned that day. And the pastor got up and said, that seals it for me. And the whole church began to rejoice. Now, there was a few hardcore, you know, and listen, if you're pre-trib, just run with it. I pray to God it happens. Amen. But Scripture tells me something different. Amen. And if you go up, catch me, and I'll ride with you, I guess. Amen. My understanding, and listen, this is, you know what started me that changed my heart? Because when I got out of being a heathen and got into the church, I was indoctrinated with this. And I went to the prison, and I, which I still do, and I was going up there, and there were four of us, and we would go into this room, and we'd preach. We'd all take turns. One week is my week, and we would just rotate in the month. And when it wasn't my turn to preach, I had liberty to go out with the sellies, and I would just go to their playing pool and ping pong, and I'd share the gospel with them. And I'll, I'll never forget this man. His name was, he was a black man. His name was Kincaid. And I walked up to him, and I wanted him to come to church, but he wouldn't come in there because one of the pastors had made a, a kind of a racial remark, and he said, I'll never set foot in that place. So I'll begin to talk to him about the coming of the Lord and how God's going to rapture us out of here. And this is what he said. He looked at me. He said, I'll cut you with the word. I said, what are you talking about? He said, there ain't no pre-tribulation rapture. I said, so we begin to battle, right? And he said, listen, he said, God will sustain us through it. I said, no, brother, we're leaving before. So after that day, I went home and I got my Bible. I'm like, I'm going to prove him wrong. And I begin to dig and I begin to study and I begin to dig and I begin to study. And all these, I couldn't get these things to they just would not connect. I'm like, I don't understand this. I'd go to the, the church and they'd shout the house down on pre-trib. And I'm sitting there cold as a creek rock thinking, I've got to be out of the will of God. I mean, I've got to go back to pray. I just, i got to be wrong because they're all eating this up. And I just can't join in. And one day I was listening to a message by Rolf Barnard. If you ever want to hear a man of God to get you under conviction, you just dig him up. He'll send you straight to your knees, amen, quickly. And I was listening to him, and he made a statement about Revelation 14, and they that were redeemed being the first fruits. And it was just like the last nail in the coffin. I thought, that is the truth. So, am I saying I got all truth? No. I'm so thankful for Pastor Scott and Pastor Matthew and Pastor Ken and Pastor Charles and for the people that come and teach the, the nuggets and Brother Matthew and Kevin and all of you because I'm learning. Amen. I'm ever learning. I don't have all knowledge. All I know is what God taught me. But this is my understanding. If you want to put your finger in the spot, it's safe to stay in the bounds of holy writings. Amen. It's safe to stay where Scripture gives us the warrant to walk in, it's a safe place to be, right? No matter what theology tells you, no matter what doctrines and, and dispensationalists tell you, the Word of God will stand when this world is on fire. God's Word will stand, amen? And I think it very well could be that's the lie that a lot of people are going to struggle with when things change and tribulation comes and persecution is here. It's not over there. It's right here on my backside. And people are going to look at their pastor and say, you said we're leaving and they're going to be speechless in that hour. But to you that know these things, guess what will happen? He will rise with healing in his wings. Amen. There is a joy to knowing this. Listen, I'm not fearful and I'm not you know, rubbing my hands together. I don't understand things. God has told me how it's going to happen that when it comes, I've got confidence. God has done told me it's going to be just like this. So our confidence is in knowing the scriptures. And it's been declared from the prophets but they didn't have all the revelation. Daniel cried out, God, give me the understanding 
Daniel, you're a man beloved to God. Just seal up the writing. It's for a time at the end of which I'll unveil it. I'll take the lid off and they'll understand it. But you, you're going to be with me. I've got a special place for you, Daniel. You just be content that you're loved of me. Ain't that what the scripture says? No, yes, maybe. Yes, it does say that. Amen. Father, we bless you today, Lord. May God be true and every man a liar. Lord, hide your word in our heart. Lord, I'm not, I'm not excited that there's people that hold to error. Lord, I held to error. And there's probably places in my life, Lord, still that you need to get the grip off of some things. And I acknowledge that before you. But Father, I just believe that in this generation, this time, the veil is being torn, Lord, in our understanding and that true righteousness is being raised up and the truth of your word is again being given to the body. Lord, give us the truth, Lord. You said the truth would set us free. Father, bless the reading of your word, we ask in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen.